Good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Generally Irritable with Erica Reddick. I am super excited to be coming to you on this Monday evening, January 11th. Uh, as usual, there is a Taekwondo class going on for about 30 more minutes next door. So if you hear children screaming in the background, that's why I swear, for real, I swear. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear it or not, but uh, I'm super excited to be here this evening with David Perro and Chris Hazley, uh, two guys who are incredibly knowledgeable about what's going on in the city with the short-term rental market and, uh, and advocates really for, for landlords and homeowners um, to, to, you know, be able to keep our private property rights. Uh, which, which, as you guys may know, is a dirty word in Burlington. Um, you're not allowed to say things like that, private property rights. Um, but that's really what we are going to be talking about this evening, is what is it that the city is trying to do to, uh, to make it so that landlords or property owners cannot um, or will be uh, penalized for being Airbnb hosts, for doing short-term rentals, and just private property rights in general in Burlington, how they've been infringed on over the years. So um, if you guys want to first introduce yourselves, and um, David, why don't you go ahead first, give everybody, uh, uh, tell everybody a little bit about who you are and why this topic matters to you. Well, I, uh, a little bit of my background, uh, I've been in law enforcement since my early 20s and uh, eventually became a prosecutor in Rockingham County, working out of several courts. So um, I'm very, very familiar with the criminal uh, justice system. And, uh, you know, I have always, as I endeavor into any new uh, business venture or something of that nature, really looked into, um, you know, the Airbnb and short-term rentals uh, that are available on different apps, as well as, uh, you know, direct advertising. And uh, so I've made it my business to really educate myself about, you know, what the requirements are and what the impact is really in, uh, in Burlington and what the benefits of Airbnb are. And, uh, and I also have had other gig type uh, experiences, gig economy type experience businesses where um, I have come face to face with, um, you know, hostility of new ideas coming into Burlington mm -hmm. and uh, the prevailing need to regulate, regulate mm -hmm. and regulate um, things basically into uh, making it uh, nearly impossible to sustain a business model with an ever-changing legal environment. Mm. Oh, that's a so, very delicate uh, way of putting it. I hope that I can bring something to the conversation here regarding that uh, and some of my experience dealing with the city and uh, certainly um, be able to convey to you and others that may be listening here today uh, about the benefits of how the Airbnb benefits Burlington and the, uh, the tourism that yeah. is uh, generated and brings new people into the city that are here to spend money on local businesses. Um, so there's a lot of upside and not a lot of downside. I like and uh, so I that's like what I hope to bring to this, uh, to this forum. And uh, I've worked closely with, uh, with Chris as well. And uh, we've had a lot of time to talk about this. So um, go ahead, Chris. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Chris, tell us a little bit about you. Um, I've been a resident of Burlington um, for over 20 years. I've been a renter for the entirety of the time that I've been here. So, and I'm also a, a short-term rental host on the Airbnb platform. Um, and I, I just wanted to comment upon uh, David's um, statement regarding innovation. And I think that that's a concern here. And typically, as I'm sure most of you recognize, is that when a uh, new technology or new service or a new way of business comes along and disrupts the existing way to do things, um, there's often a, a very strong and quick reaction from those who are kind of wanting to cling on to the old ways and really try to regulate the, the new approach. And I think we've seen that initially, as David pointed out, uh, with Uber. 
Uh, we're seeing mm -hmm. it now with Airbnb. And um, we're also seeing it in Burlington with respect to food trucks. And, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to weigh in <coughs> on discussion uh, last year. And it was very clear to me that the established players in the local restaurant industry, that is those who had bricks and mortar restaurants, uh, were really not open to the idea of food trucks coming to town, mm -hmm. which was, you know, kind of uh, unfortunate because the uh, representatives from the city clerk's office uh, was stating that there were a number of applicants that uh, had been turned away because they, they just didn't have enough slots available. So um, I'm of the opinion that this is something that the market should decide. And in order to do that, we have to have a strong competition from a number of players. And overall, I think the goal of any public policy is to um, ben you know, maximize the benefit of the public good here and, and recognizing mm -hmm. that you know, when government's involved, there's no such thing as a perfect solution. There's always going to be someone who feels that perhaps they've gotten the short end of the stick. And I think mm -hmm. the goal also is to kind of minimize the number of people that feel that way. But um, on the whole, I think government like uh, nature has a, a tendency to equilibrium and, and that's what i'm hoping to uh, talk a little bit more about tonight yes yes and for the record i want everyone to know chris is one of my favorite people to have a conversation with about anything related to politics because uh we 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 are sort of like opposites on the political spectrum but there's so much that we agree on uh, we just kind of come to it from different places and so when I was thinking about having uh, doing a show on this topic, Chris was the one person that I really, really wanted to come on because he's just really passionate about it. And he is really good at articulating why he believes what he believes. And I just, you're my favorite person to argue with Chris. Um, <laughs> and, and then, and Chris introduced me to David as somebody who is really knowledgeable, just a really smart guy who really understands the process. And so I'm really just, I'm just really grateful to have you both here so that we can educate Burlington on what's going on, because that is the biggest hurdle I have found. Um, you know, in a city the size of ours, there, not only do we have, uh, you know, a city council meeting every other week, there's 400 different committees and commissions that also meet on a regular basis. Oftentimes they meet in the middle of the day when people can't attend. Um, and people with jobs and businesses and families just don't have the ability to keep up with all of the proposed legislation, all of the changes. And so when we can kind of distill things down into an hour or 90 minute conversation so people can understand what their city councilors and their mayor are doing or their legislature, depending on uh, depending on the topic, it's super important just to get that information out there. So that's going to be our goal today. Now, what are we thinking? Oh, my God. How, I, I should have written down where I want to start. The first thing is, I guess, for a little bit of background, Chris, do you want to, like, catch everybody up on why we're even having this conversation? Uh, yeah, we can talk a little bit about that for sure. Um, so... As I understand it, the mayor sponsored a housing summit. I think it was back in the summer of 2019. That's correct. Yeah. He's facing the market. And, um, you know, there's there has been, I think, for the 20 plus years that I've lived in town, there's been um, a documented shortage of what is considered affordable housing. And my understanding is that the classic definition of affordable housing means that uh, no more than one third, 33 percent of your income should be spent on housing. And if you're you're paying more than 33% of your income on housing, that's not considered affordable. And, you know, 20 years ago when I came here, um, you know, there were some constant um, conversations regarding student housing. And I think that that is still um, impacting uh, the situation here in Burlington today. And, um, you know, it's, 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 I think basically it comes down to a supply and demand problem. Now, uh, to credit the mayor, there's been a number of new developments that I think Cambrian rise up uh, on North Avenue, the former Burlington College campus, um, the uh, Stratus Lofts, I believe, down on St. Paul, and then, of course, directly across the street from that, the brand new uh, college dorm that was uh, constructed by Champlain Housing, and certainly that's uh, contributing to the situation, but I think there's this... Um, misunderstanding uh, about the role that short-term rentals play in uh, the Burlington housing market and folks I think are kind of of the opinion that well we're exacerbating the issue when the reality is is that the number of units is I think less than three percent 
And, you know, from my perspective, as someone who lived over in the Buell Street neighborhood for well over a decade, um, during the time that I lived there, there was out of, I think, 30 something houses on the street, there was one and only one that was owner occupied. And the entire neighborhood, along with neighboring streets on Bradley Street, South Union, Green Street, Isham Street, and Loomis Street on the other side of Pearl Street, um, have over a number of years, probably the last 30 to 40 years, become uh, de facto student housing. And if you drive through those neighborhoods, you'll see that they are largely single family homes that are either rented out as an entire house or um, split up into various um, separate units that are then, then rented out. And of course, with any um, income producing property, the value of the property is determined by the amount of revenue that is generated by that property. And that's a concern for me because I mentioned, you know, before I'm, you know, 47 years old, I'm married, I have a, have a son. And, you know, my wife and I are now looking outside the city of Burlington at, for a place to live because that's how far we have to go to hit the realm of affordability. We simply cannot afford a half a million dollar home in the hill section. And we're really not interested in getting a fixer upper at three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. And well, think, and even even when you're talking about outside of downtown, not in the hill section, um, the the three percent. I'm curious how many of those are whole units versus um, single rooms? Because what what I remember of the statistics that we heard from people who were sharing. My understanding is the majority of Airbnb units in Burlington, in the Burlington area, are actually rooms. Um, and I think they said something like 60%, more than 60%, some huge percentage were actually women over the age of 60 who were retired, single, widowed, who were renting out extra rooms basically to cover property taxes and stuff like that. Does that uh, yeah. sound about right? Uh, well, not entirely, but there are certainly a number of folks that fit that description that are using the rental income from a short-term rental uh, to uh, do, as you say, <coughs> rent, pay the mortgage and, uh, you know, basically keep a roof over their head. And now the data that I have here in front of me, I think that there is close to uh, 400 uh, units that are, um, are currently available as whole units. And I think that uh, 270, 84 of them, approximately 71%. Um, would qualify as um, longer term housing. Now, that's out of approximately over 10,000 apartments in Burlington, which, you know, the, some quick mass that comes out to about less than 3% of the, the rental market. So while I think that, you know, there's certainly an argument that can be made, I think a more apt and appropriate market or argument, excuse me, is the need to uh, work with our partners up on UVM uh, and the local colleges to ensure that they provide an, an adequate supply of housing for their students. Now, in fairness to the students, um, off-campus housing is, is particularly attractive, and, and it's, um, I think, even more so attractive now given the changing regulatory uh, requirement uh, re regarding uh, recreational cannabis. Um, as you are probably maybe aware, the University of Vermont and pretty much all institutions of higher education receive federal funds, and currently uh, under federal law, cannabis uh, is on a Schedule One, which means that it is illegal. And so in order to maintain the revenue stream from the federal government, the universities uh, and colleges here in Vermont are required to essentially enforce federal law, even though the state of Vermont has itself re uh, legalized recreational cannabis. So I think, you know, if you have an option and you're to live on campus, you're a student and you live on campus and you have to worry about the knock and sniffs, or you could maybe go down and get a place on Buell Street and, you know, do your thing in the privacy of your own home. I think that there's certainly um, can understand that perspective for sure. Hmm. Erica, I think you lost your audio. I was uh, muting myself because you can hear my husband typing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, David. I appreciate that. So uh, Not a thank problem. You. UVM is is the elephant in the room it seems like none of our regulators want to talk about. When you bring it up and when you say things like, you know, the University of Vermont owns a over a billion dollars worth of assets in Burlington and pays zero taxes. And that um, the majority of like a huge portion of rental property in Burlington is like you said, Chris, de facto student housing. And then 
they, and then those same people who don't want to address that giant elephant in the room, then pivot and demonize Airbnb and short-term rental hosts as being the problem. Like we're taking all of these houses or all these apartments off the market when, when it's just not the case. Like you said, I think it's three, you said 3%. And when now, David, I'd like you to speak to this. We know that the, that Vermont, our primary, uh, uh, economy is is tourism it's tourism and when indeed yes and and so we've spent burlington and vermont have spent millions and millions of dollars to be to beautify the area to make it attractive to tourists to the college students and their families and and, and to attract people and now they're in many ways they're trying to like shrink the the average person's ability to also be part of that economy. Um, would you speak right. to that a little bit and your experience like with well, Uber I'd and stuff happy like that? To. And, uh, I'd like to start off, you know, with uh, the, you know, the elephant in the room that you were talking about, the, the UVM issue, you know, they're the big guys, okay? And they, they affect the housing market in Burlington greater than anything else uh, by the factor of, you know, hundreds actually and it's it's um so the regulatory environment that's being um endeavored upon uh to airbnb and short-term rental people we're the little guys we're the little guys maybe airbnb is a big corporation but it's empowering the little guy to participate in an economy um and to better their financial situation and especially during this past year with uh people losing maybe their second job or losing both of their jobs you know it gives them a great deal of uh, ability for some flexibility in you know perhaps being able to even you know rent out their space if it's an attractive space and it meets the Airbnb guidelines and cleanliness and 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 amenities, and uh, you know the majority of people when they come to Burlington want to stay either in the country, you know which is not Burlington per se, but when they come to Vermont they want to stay in the country in the mountains and take in that, and then the others are coming here for, you know the. Uh, the downtown experience, the restaurants, Church Street Marketplace, and so forth. And so the Airbnbs that exist within the, the, the confines of the downtown area, you know, uh, really expand uh, the ability for people who want to come to Burlington and experience it, not out of a sterile hotel room experience, uh, not in this environment where, you know, uh, they're basically in a you know a, a massive building and so forth, especially with the concerns with uh, you know the pandemic and so forth. Uh, people, you know, following the guidelines, the COVID guidelines set out by Airbnb, and uh, those possibly could be expanded. However, it gives them the option to be able to bring their family to a home or an apartment and uh, and experience the city in a real way. And that has that has two benefits. First of all, you have a captive audience in the downtown who is, you know, really those are people that are going to be coming and spending money at the shops. They're people that are going to be spending money at the restaurants. Whereas, you know, uh, you know, keeping you know apartments available or regulating Airbnb out of business with the idea, which I don't think it would even achieve it, but. Um, so that you know college students or just people general people working in the area are not going to be coming here for a week or 10 days or a couple of weeks or even a month you know these folks that come in on the airbnb are hitting restaurants every single night they're going and shopping at patagonia and and uh, all the shops and so forth along you know uh, church street and uh, enjoying the waterfront and going to concerts and really are here to participate in the tourism of Vermont. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so uh, there is that. Well, and I think, uh, I think so it's really interesting that 
you know, one of the things that the, the new charter change or the rules proposed to do is to have add a $7,000 impact fee per room. And Chris, what is it when it's the whole unit? It's like $25,000 or something, right? You know, I'm not sure if that's still in the most recent proposal coming out of the, the uh, committee, okay. but I do want to touch on that and just wanted to, you know, kind of uh, expand upon what David had said about the downtown core. For those who are not familiar, the downtown core is typically defined as the area bordered by um, Pearl Street on the north, um, South Winooski Street. Uh, on the east and Main Street on the south, with of course the lake being the south. Now there are some folks that'll say, "Well, you know, we will go over another block to maybe South Union Street too, so you can go uh, take that into consideration." But um, the concern that I have, and particularly regarding this housing replacement fee, is and this is another area which has not really come up in the discussion. And I think it bears uh, some additional consideration: is the fact that the city is now proposing potentially to uh, impose a housing replacement fee on short-term rental hosts. But on an annual basis, as I understand it, but there are plenty of single family homes scattered throughout the downtown core that have been converted into doctor's offices, lawyer's offices, dentist's office, restaurants, other mixed use retail establishments. Um, and as I understand it, they simply pay a one time conversion fee. So it's kind of a yeah. question of equity uh, and why are the short term rental hosts being you know, treated differently than everyone else? And to. So so I'm so I staying in this vein, I wonder what the difference is between when we're talking about, okay, you want wh what kind of revenue is brought in, right? Because Airbnb hosts have to pay, you know, the uh, the what the heck is it called? The rooms and meals tax or the whatever. Rooms and meals tax, yes. Right? Yep. We collect and pay that. Then Let's say we were to remove Airbnb. We'll just use Airbnb as an example. Let's say we remove that from the marketplace in Burlington. What do we lose in sales tax revenue, in meals and rooms tax revenue, and all of the other revenues that are gained and the economic value created by those tourists? How much would the city and the state lose? Well, you know, that's a very good question to which I don't think we have an answer just yet. And while we, the city has been um, very good about providing a lot of data regarding housing and the vacancy rates and availability and the affordability, they have yet to conduct any type of economic impact study to address those very things. Now, I have intentions to follow up with City Hall to request some data um, regarding the rooms and meals tax to see what we can, because that's something we can quantify. But clearly, as, as Mr. Pearl has has um, alluded to, there is an economic uh, multiplier effect going on here. And in pre-COVID times, it's not just going out to the restaurants and going to concerts, but maybe it was going to the Flint Theater to see, see a show, perhaps going down to the Vermont Comedy Club to take in a local comedian, or any number of different things, perhaps a festival on the waterfront. Um, yep. And as I've stated before, I think, you know, policy needs to be based on facts and data. And I think that this is a critical piece of data that we simply just don't have right now. Yeah. It is a very complex, multifaceted issue. And my hope is that we can continue the discussion while making sure that all the relevant players are at the table and have a voice in the process. Well, and I think too, it's really important, you know, David and Chris, you guys have both talked about different kinds of people who would use short-term rentals and why a lot of people don't realize that there are hundreds of traveling nurses and other staff, uh, surgical techs, um, oh, what is it called? LNAs and things like that at our local hospitals, Pharmacy. nursing homes and things like that. Yeah. So um, we have people, they, I don't know why I'm not going to presume to understand um, the staffing issues at the hospital, but I do know that there are tons and tons and tons of people who come here uh, because there are there are short-term staff. And now if we get rid of the short-term market, where are all those doctors, nurses, LNAs, surgical techs gonna live? You know, cause they're not here for long periods of time. They're not gonna come sign a lease uh, for some place and, and then stay for a year or two, but they do provide a critical service that we need in Burlington. And, you know, my experience. Yeah, I'd like to speak that. that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Chris. Go ahead, David. I, I, well, I'd like to, I'd, li I'd like to speak to the, you know, um, from the legal side of things, the equal protection, um, you know, clause of our constitution, you know, um, equal protection 
and equal equality and equal rights across the board, which seems to be something that Burlington gets behind quite well. And they're also uh, get behind quite well, um, you know, uh, at least in in um, in theory, the the little guy and making sure that they have, you know, that that major corporations and, and, and big operations don't take over the city. Um, you know, and, uh, Mayor Weinberger, uh, you know, ha as part of his, uh, his platform and, and speaking about Burlington has said that he wanted downtown Burlington and Burlington to be a livable city. And, um, you know, these regulations that they're attempting to, put in place or curtail uh, certain types of short-term rentals and things like that really, you know, um, are detrimental to that the philosophy of a livable city. Because just as you have mentioned, you have people that come into town for a number of reasons. They might be coming to the, uh, they might be coming to the UVM Medical Center for a surgery and want to get a short-term rental so that they have the privacy of not being in a hotel around a bunch of people, being immuno, immunocompromised, um, and and those types of concerns as well. So, um, and uh, you know, if you know, you have like the big the the big bear in the room, UVM, that takes up most of the housing in Burlington as it is. You know, what kind of you know what kind of impact fees do they reimburse the city for? To uh, because they're obviously getting um, rather substantial tuition to bring these students in for essentially a short-term rental. They're there for they may rent for you know six months and be gone, and those places become vacant again. And you know certainly those places that become vacant that are suitable for short-term rentals, depending on what someone's looking for in the location, you know. Uh, there shouldn't be any restrictions on those landlords either. And they shouldn't have to pay huge, you know, an impact fee or anything else. Certainly the rooms and meals tax, which comes directly before the payments to the hosts, by the way, is pulled out by Airbnb and sent directly to the city. And uh, so the city is seeing many, many areas of benefit. They're seeing uh, the ability of tourism, the access to the hospital, the uh, people who come here that want to experience the city in a real way and, and uh, stay in an Airbnb in a neighborhood. And, you know, as they apply and search for employment here in, in, in Vermont and, and in Burlington, uh, whether it be at the hospital or at the university or something of that nature, they get to try on what it would be like to live in the city instead of coming into an unknown. So there's a number of reasons why people come here. The primary one is usually tourism, but certainly the travel nurses that come for three months at a time to help uh, shore up the staffing shortages uh, at uh, University Medical Center, um, and uh, as well as you know teachers and such that come to you know perhaps uh, do presentations and things, and. The, uh, the other thing I want to speak to also about the Airbnb and short-term rental situation is, is that Burlington puts a great deal of effort. This past year, of course, COVID really messed things up. But the entire summer, every single weekend in Burlington, there is another big event, which is terrific. And it's one of the things that drew me to Burlington. Um, it, there's, you know, between the bicycle races and the brew fest mm -hmm. and everything else, it mm -hmm. is there is actually a shortage of hotel rooms. Yes. So what happens is, is these people come in and, or, or try to come here to enjoy these activities and participate in Burlington's economy and tourism. And uh, they have to stay an hour and a half out of the city to try to find a place to stay. Oh, so, and then you have you know, to have cars, which they hate that people are driving, driving and there's around, not parking. And, you know, <laughs> rather than just, yes, of course, yes. Uh, and uh, so there's this, um, you know, there's there is a a benefit with every single rental, not just oh off my losses and this and that. It's not like a regular tax return type of thing. It's based on actual sales, rooms and meals. If you book, 
this money is taken right out before your payment is sent by any of these, uh, uh, you know, short-term rental uh, 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 companies like Airbnb and sent directly to the city. Yeah. And uh, I don't have those numbers offhand, Chris. I don't know if you do of exactly what the revenues have been in the past year from rooms and meals taxes from Airbnb, uh, uh, you know, stays. So, um, but so I can speak I, to that as far as Uber goes. I can tell you a bit about that and how well, about let's, what we encountered when we started that. Let's put a pin in that for now. Um, I know we don't have the exact right. numbers right now because we haven't been able to get them from the city, but. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things that I think is really important that you touched on that I that I don't want to get that I don't want to move past or don't want to gloss over is this idea of picking winners and losers. It's as if mm -hmm. the city is deciding who the winners and losers are going to be. And I often wonder sometimes and Chris, maybe you might have an opinion on this. When, when we see the people who are the landowners and the property owners who have a vested interest in making sure that their property values stay high and therefore rents stay high and things like that, and then they squeeze out these smaller entrepreneur type businesses, these gig type businesses, um, do you see any of that? I mean, I'm asking you to, and you may not wanna say what your opinion is here. Maybe I'm asking, what's that word? where I'm like asking you to guess something. There's like a legal term for it. Um, I'm leading the witness or something. Um, but <laughs> like, do you see that? Leading question. Something? Yeah. So, yeah. To your point, Erica, I, I agree. And again, I want to re remind everyone that I am a renter and I have been for, I think, 21 years at this point. And yeah. again, if this is a multifaceted uh, issue here, but I do agree that, you know, at the end of the day, if you have property, you should be able to make your own decisions on it. And despite being a renter, I have met a number of small landlords, but maybe one or two buildings that they have. And a lot of them turn to short-term rentals uh, because they've had one or more bad experiences with a long-term tenant. Now I can speak, now I live in a multi-unit building and I can speak that there's a handful of us that are renters that do work as Airbnb hosts because we have traveling job and our, our landlord is aware of that. Um, but, you know, I've had the experience where, you know, one of the neighbors thought it would be a good idea to, oh, how shall I say, reenact some cooking scenes from Breaking Bad. And um, so while there's, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides to every story, and I think what happens here is that you ha run into the issue of economies of scale. And there's, you know, probably three or four large uh, property management companies here in Burlington, a.k.a. landlords, that have, you know, upwards of 100 or more units. And eventually you get to a point where, you know, it's, you're stretched really thin and, you know, there's an issue, people complain. And so the city attempts to, to remediate the issue. And I think some of the smaller players end up getting wrapped up in well-intentioned uh, regulation that really puts a hamper on their ability to make a living or to uh, derive benefit from the property that they own and pay taxes on. And, um, you know, I just think that people are going to, gravitate to an area or an opportunity uh, with greater economic benefit. That's just uh, economics 101. And as David has said previously, you know, when you have a short-term renter who's coming here as a tourist, they're one, they're spending money, you know, in the accommodation, whether it's a short-term rental or a hotel room, regardless, either way, the city is collecting uh, revenue in the forms of the rooms and meals tax, which I think is uh, either around 10.5% or 11%. I don't remember the, the number off the top of my head, but oftentimes they're going out to eat, whether it's lunch or dinner or breakfast, they're going to an, an event. Maybe they head off to a brewery tour. Maybe they go to a ghost tour. Maybe they head off down to the farmer's market down on um, Pine Street or any, any number of things. Maybe they decide to go down to the waterfront or heck, maybe they go all the way up to the end of North Avenue and visit Charlie's Boathouse and decide to rent kayaks for the afternoon. Uh, and, and take a, take in the natural beauty that Burlington has to offer. And that is the multiplier effect that I don't think that we see uh, brought on by longer term tenants who are really oftentimes struggling to survive because of the issue with the student housing when, you know, um, folks that are in that market can charge uh, a very substantial amount of money to uh, for the, the properties that they have. And in my view, I think the city um, has not done a very good job of ensuring the health of the neighborhood. Now, I did speak to someone who works in the housing industry a while back, and 
I think it was the same conversation about what constitutes an affordable uh, housing. Um, and the, the recollection I have is that for a neighborhood to be quote unquote healthy, there needs to be a good mix of both renters and long-term homeowners. And again, from my perspective as a long-term renter, you know, essentially being forced out of the city because we cannot find an affordable, you know, home here in the city because a lot of the suitable properties have been converted into rental units uh, for the sole and exclusive purposes of housing um, college students. And while that may be uh, great for the individual property owners, it, it's not really uh, advantageous for those of us who would like to stay here and raise a family. That's pricing us out of the market. Well, and I think that's, it seems like, you know, it's funny because I, I made the graphic for this show as being the landlords association versus the tenants union. And because it seems like that's the way all of these conversations are framed, you know, it's us versus them. They're the bad guy. We're the victim, you know, whatever, you know, fill in the blank. But the reality, as I, as far as I can tell, is is just bad um, zoning management. So we have all of these regulations about where you can or cannot build, um, you know, a ten unit housing, and this is in the state of Vermont generally. So it's it's I'm sure it's different and more in Burlington. But uh, well, last I knew, last I knew, hold on. It was a hundred thousand dollars in impact fees and environmental studies to build a 10 unit apartment complex. And that's before you've put a shovel in the ground or even drawn an architectural drawing. And so like, how can they blame existing property owners for being the problem when they make it impossible to build anything? Well, I think that there's something to be said uh, for the regulation piece there. Now I'm not a developer and I can't speak very well to that process, uh, process excuse me, that's yeah. uh, outside the realm of my experience. Um, but the other issue that kind of compounds it is there's just not a lot of available land in Burlington to uh, build on, unless of course, you know, you take into consideration the big giant hole, um, <laughs> in, putting it politely, in the middle of downtown. And, you know, David and I were speaking just the other day that, you know, that we thought that that would be a great site for the city to, you know, encourage some development there. And if they're not able to do it with the private sector, then maybe, you know, the um, they can cut a deal and make it happen. But um, well, there's also a lot of room for what they call infill construction, where there are certain areas of town where they can allow for buildings to be built up, um, where like it's only a one story building, but it could be a three or a five story building. But yeah, again, yeah. there, the regulatory process is so onerous, nobody will do it. Yeah, there's certainly some height restrictions there. And I have some familiarity with the, the type of infill that your development uh, that you're speaking of. Uh, as I understand it, that was quite fashionable and in vogue uh, in the early 80s. Um, you know, and, and the concern there, I think, from folks that I've talked with is, is that when you start putting that uh, level of density in a traditional neighborhood, you're losing green space. You know, and there's something to be said for green space, particularly if you're a small fa young family trying to raise kids, you want to have that backyard. Um, and when you start putting in the density, there's trade-offs as there are, you know, with everything. And again, it goes back to making sure all of the appropriate stakeholders are at the table. They have a voice in the process and really trying to find a way to maximize the public good uh, in a way that minimizes the number of people who feel like they've, they've gotten the short end of the stick. Um, I don't know that I have all the answers, but I do know that if we bring the right people to the table and we have some good conversations and we act in good faith, that I, I think that we'll eventually get there. Um, now, yeah, I David. Also wanted to, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, go I ahead, to David. I in on, on something here. Um, you know, uh, the city is also uh, benefiting doubly because all of these properties that are being used for short term rentals and Airbnb and so forth and um, uh, are, they're collecting property taxes on the property. Um, and they're also collecting rooms and meals when anybody rents out, you know, a room or, or the unit or a house. So they're getting money on both sides. Well, let's not forget issue. about the uh, registration oh, fee either. And oh, yeah. Right. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. You know, um, but you know, there's, you know, you talk, one of the, one of the big concerns is, is, you know, property rights here and um does the city like 
to draw a reference to what Chris uh, had said when we talked about the big giant hole in the middle of uh, Burlington, the big giant ugly hole that's been there for years now. And, uh, you know, it seems like uh, the people who are trying to work towards the betterment of Burlington uh, are overlooking the big giant hole in front of them and trying to regulate and micromanage every single aspect of everything and try to manage everything when they can't even manage what they have on their plate now. And uh, they're creating, as uh, Chris and I have discussed many times, and I have to credit him with this statement that, um, that he brought to this particular discussion is that they are, you know, they're regulating in search of, uh, you know, in search of a problem, you know, uh, the, the problem, you know, there, you, the fact is, is that, you know, even even in um, the buildings, you know, that I'm familiar with, where people have Airbnbs in the downtown, each of the, those buildings have already regulated by the city an allotment of affordable housing. It has to be set aside for affordable housing and vouchers through the Vermont Housing Authority. And any new development that goes in, any new buildings that go in, or any renovations that convert a building from one purpose to housing, there has to be allotments for affordable housing, and they have to be apartments that can be vouchered through the Vermont Housing Authority. So it's not as if someone's going in and saying, okay, here's this great new building that's been renovated, and it's just going to be sucked up by all people doing Airbnb. Um, it's there are already provisions of protection in place um, that, you know, protect, you know, to some degree, the availability of somebody who wants to live in the downtown and work in the downtown and perhaps not have a car and be able to walk to their job on Church Street. And, and, and those things are available now. You could be working at a convenience store downtown and walk across the street and, um, you know, uh, based on income, be able to uh, establish, uh, you know, housing through Vermont Housing Authority and other programs. So, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're trying to squelch, you know, free enterprise. And, um, you know, and I loved your comment, Erica, about the, you know, the, you know, the, the, just the, the, the massive amount of, uh, uh, regulatory bodies that seem to exist, this committee and that committee and so forth and so on. And the more committees you have, you have people who go in with the best of intentions, but they feel as if they're not doing something like imposing some type of regulation or new ordinance in, in, you know, in their tenure, that they're not doing their job. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so it's like, you know, what can we dream up now? What can we do? Yeah. What can we possibly come up with? You know, let's, oh, Airbnb or Uber, uh, you know, they, uh, and, and uh, not to get off of uh, the short-term rental thing, but Burlington sees these as opportunities to regulate, which like they did with Uber. And, you know, uh, and I think it came down to economics eventually. You know, mm -hmm. my personal experiences with, you know, doing Uber in Burlington was that the city, from the parking people through the police department, you know, uh, were extremely hostile to uh, Uber drivers uh, in the city. And uh, we were constant, constantly being pulled over, harassed, our cars banged on while we were trying to pick up and drop off passengers. And, you know, um, you know you'd be pulled over because you were driving in a neighborhood at three o'clock in the morning you know, and then they were harassing people over having an Uber light in the front window and trying to say that it's a blue light and it's the, it's our color, the police, you know, and, you know, there's all of this, you know, but when they looked at the numbers and they took all of the cab companies combined, and I know this is a bit off topic, but it is pertinent to this. When they took all of this, um, all the cab companies and added up the fees that they paid to the city you know, based on, you know, their per ride, you know, taxes that they paid to the city as a cab company or an individual cab operator. Within, within I believe, the second year of Uber being in Burlington, 
Um, I think the numbers, and this is very roughly stated, I'm just going to give you a very ballpark uh, example, but this was in a seven days article um, where I first saw these statistics. Um, there was something like in a particular quarter, there was $20,000 collected from all of the cab companies that service Burlington combined. And there was something like $80,000 of fees collected in that same time period from Uber. So, you know, uh, it took me actually going to the police department, speaking with the chief of police and the deputy chief about the constant harassment, which was the first step, which didn't really seem to get much traction and we still continued to be harassed. But then when the city saw the amount of revenue they were bringing in, they changed their tune. So, um, you know, and now it's, you know, a staple in Burlington and in most cities that people are looking for the more personal and the more direct and, and, and quick service of Uber over a cab company. And certainly there's room for both in the market. And now they that serve being said, you know, things. I did, uh, I will say because Uber is such a thing now, there was one time I went mm -hmm. out and I went to Burlington, out in downtown Burlington, I went out dancing. And it was two o'clock in the morning and I, and there was no Ubers running. And I was like, I don't even know oh, how gosh. to get home without an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> so, Erica, oh my goodness. A lot yeah. of people have that feeling. I think these days. Yeah. So Chris, Erica, what you got? Go back to uh, one of the uh, organizations that you brought up uh, earlier, which was the Burlington Talent Tenants Union. Now I'm, I'm not from, uh, associated with them. But I, I think that they bring an important uh, voice to the uh, to the discussion as well, and I, I applaud them for the work that they're doing. Certainly, I think we can all agree that they have a First Amendment right to organize, and I, I'm glad that they have. Mm -hmm. I think that the folks that belong to that organization, as I understand it, are really typically ordinary Vermonters, and um, I know that for them and the, the stuff that I've read, affordability is a key issue, which again ties into um, some of the issues that we've talked to with UVM, and it's it's not that we want to keep putting the finger at UVM and placing the blame. I think that that's one aspect of the problem, but it's a, it's an important aspect that mm -hmm. um, needs to be addressed. And again, tying back to what I said about the downtown core with uh, buildings being converted into non-residential uses, I think we've seen that up often in the campus district where we have a number of old Victorian homes that are now being used for uh, offices for various departments of the university mm -hmm. um, as well. So, um, but back to the, the topic of, of affordability, one thing that stuck out to me here, and so I had an opportunity to speak with one of the gentlemen that runs a, a, a food cart down in the Church Street Marketplace uh, in the space uh, in front of City Hall between Main Street and College Street. And, you know, I was quite shocked to learn that the, the permitting fees to operate a food cart was something like $2,700 a year, which was like the ridiculously high. Now, one of the programs that I, I, I'm familiar with here in town, and, and I think it's a great program, and I really want to uh, give them a shout out, is the micro business development program. And, you know, in the olden days, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would like start food carts, um, you know, as a business. And, and it was kind of a stepping stone to bigger and, and better things. And a great example of that is, um, you know, the folks down on the waterfront with the skinny pancake who began their operations, I want to say 2003, 2004, as a a uh, food cart on Church Street. And now, you know, the whole reason this issue came up is the city's ordinances relating to uh, food trucks uh, date back to 1995. They're like, you know, 25 years old. And under those current regulations, the downtown core has designated spaces and only two of them are designated for food trucks. One of those licenses also belongs to a bricks and mortar restaurant here in the downtown core, which uses uh, the truck mainly for catering events. And then the other mm -hmm. guy uh, had a permit and was operating right around the corner um, on College Street. And, um, you know, he was only paying $300 a year for his permit. And, you know, there were folks uh, on, you know, Church Street that were up in arms about this. Well, why do we have to pay, you know, $2,700 while this guy's paying, you know, 300 or 500 or whatever it was. And, you know, they think they make a very good point. And from my perspective, you know, I think that that's just a case of better business. And I suspect that the operator of the food truck maybe did his homework, did some investigation, was like, geez, you know, if I move 300 feet around the corner, I can get a permit, I can run a food truck and not have to pay these exorbitant fees, which kind of leads me to what what's going on with the marketplace? I mean, they charge these fees for whatever, and it, it seems like it's going into, mar into marketing or something because it's clearly not going into maintenance. And I can tell you, you know, take a walk up the marketplace, mm. Take a left there on what is it 
Bank Street, head over towards, uh, you know, uh, Henry's Diner. Take a look at the at the ground and the bricks you there. You know, the missing bricks. It's just it's woefully unmaintained. And while I certainly commend um, the city's leadership for building new construction for the residential, I think there's something to be said for you know bringing us back to basics and you know rebuilding Burlington and and keeping uh, and maintaining what we have. And that's you know our sidewalks and making sure that they get cleaned in the winter. And it's it's not just about having the little truck come through and plow a path, I mean, it would be nice to actually have the entire sidewalk clear so that when people come into the downtown core, they can actually step out of their vehicle onto the sidewalk and not into a bank. <laughs> oh, bank. So wait. Climb over so wait. it to get to the side, sidewalk. I'm Chris, sorry, are off. you? Yeah, it's a little off topic. I'm going to bring us back. But what I hear you saying is that the city should stick to doing the business of the city rather than regulating everybody's personal private businesses. <laughs> um, uh, but one of the questions I want to ask, and this is one of those things that you're not allowed to say, because if you do, you're a big, mean baddie, and, and it means you hate people, and you hate poor people, and you hate everybody. Um, but I want to, I really don't understand this idea. Like, why do people believe that they have the right to live in my home? Why is it that the city believes or that the tenants union believes or that anybody believes that they have some right to my property? This is the thing that I find so confusing. Why is it that if I've worked incredibly hard and I, you know, I'm a small business owner, I work about four jillion hours a week um, on my business, let alone, you know, my personal endeavors like this podcast, doing politics, uh, being a landlord, maintaining the property, doing all of that. Why does anyone believe that they have a right to my labor? That's what I can't figure out. Does and that might be too oh, touchy. Be a, um, Before I ask this, how much time do we have left? Because uh, you know, I, <laughs> and, you know, I uh, simply say that <laughs> I think that that's really a symptom of a, of a much larger problem, and it's the you know the overarching uh, wealth inequality in this country. And when people can't afford to make a living, you know, it's a problem. And I've always believed that if you full-time work, you work 40 hours a week, you should be able to put a roof over your head and food on the table. And there was a time in this country some, you know, 50, 60 years ago when it was, you know, possible for one person working 40 hours a week to make enough money to put a roof over their head and food on the table for a family of four. And, you know, we, we can get into, you know, any number of discussions about the, the income there, but... At the end of the day, we have a large uh, number of folks here in Burlington that are really struggling to uh, pay the rent and put a roof over that, and even more so now in the middle of the COVID pandemic. And um, while I always believe that um, you know more, building more housing is certainly going to help the the problem, I also think that we need to be mindful that not everyone is uh, as fortunate as some of us may be. And I think it's there's a social good that has to be done. And I, you know, I feel like folks maybe need to consider. Um, how they can contribute to the, to the betterment of society. Now, I don't disagree with that, but I, you know, I'm not rich. I take care of, you know, my husband and I work very hard. We take care of my mother. Um, and it used to be that there were multifamily households. So this idea, a lot of times you see, you know, single mothers, and this is not a cut on single mothers, but you see single parents, um, you know, older folks living by themselves rather than in multi-generational households. So yeah. yes, we used to be able to do more with less, but, but that was because people did that as a team and as a unit and as a family. And well, so I, think, I was just saying, I think that you need to remember that the, um, you know, I think the fabric of society has changed. What constitutes a household has changed. And, um, you know, to your, your comment, uh, we ended up, prior conversation that we'd had, perhaps the, you know, the adult children have had to move away to find better economic opportunity and mom and dad are, you know, are left, are left at home. It's, you know, people have to sometimes move uh, for better to improve their, their situation. Um, I, I don't know the, the answer to that, but um, I do believe that, you know, if you work full time, um, 40 hours a week, you ought to be able to make, uh, put a roof over your head. Now, um, we've seen a lot here in the pandemic. We've heard a lot about essential workers, and it is my opinion that if you are deemed to be an essential worker, you should be paid an essential wage, and you should be able to make enough money to do just that, put a roof over your head, food on the table, and oh, and while we're at it, let's give them some health care too. 
Let's not go there, okay? Because that is not what this conversation is about. Um, but I do want to I do want to weigh in on on the on on the on, on your statement, Erica. You know that you know, like you say, I'm not wealthy. You know, and 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 I think I think people are of the impression that people that do these short term rentals and Airbnbs are somehow privileged and have, you know, a tremendous income and they're just using their income to, you know, expand and, you know, do this Airbnb business and this is a new gig and it's a way for them to make money. But this is something that's entry level for any person as long as their landlord permits them. And I can't think of a good reason why the landlord wouldn't permit it uh, because uh, in order to run an Airbnb business, you have to have a spotlessly clean, beautifully maintained space, and you have to keep it that way. So that's good for landlords. It also, you know, you might have someone who has an apartment, a young lady or a young man, and they have an apartment or a studio by themselves in the downtown, and they go home for a couple of months, and they want to be able to keep their apartment, and they can't be affording to you know, keep the rent paid and maybe go out and help mom and dad or go on a vacation. So they can actually go into the Airbnb site. They can set it up, do the photographs, go through the background check and follow all the legal rules and so forth. And their account is set up. You know, the city is getting revenue and this provides a, a, a great source of income, not a tremendous source of income, but some income to help these people along. So it is a lot of little guys that are doing this. These are people yeah. who are just like we, as we go through the gig economy, which is the, you know, the buzzword for the last couple of years here with Uber and Lyft and Instacart and all these different, uh, you know, Uber Eats and all these things. People are finding ways to make income in less traditional ways. And, you know, uh, how, you know, it's essentially a way to help to employ yourself while you're working and so forth and employ, you know, other ways to, to get revenue into your household. And it may be the difference between having to go to the city and say, geez, you know, I need housing assistance or I need, you know, uh, food stamps or, you know, that kind of thing or or taxing on other you know programs that are out there in Burlington. It's helping to keep people from falling, you know, falling through the cracks too, as well as, you know, as well as providing a great source of, you know, um, service to Burlington. Well, because when people I come in, Parents Weekend, for example, I want to just say, Parents Weekend, for example, just one of the days, one of the big days, you cannot find an Airbnb or a hotel room virtually anywhere in Chittenden County. And so these people that, you know, might say, I'm going to go stay with a friend for this week and I'm going to make my place available and list it up on Airbnb and have that income. The city gets their piece of the pie. They don't have to chase down these individual tenants or, or property owners for the rooms and meals tax because it's already withdrawn immediately right out of the payment before it receives, uh, it goes to the host. So you know, it's really something that is not requiring regulation. And the only regulation I think that they need to actually engage in, if any, is things to do with health and safety, not interfering with capitalism and the ability to be the captain of your own ship and a master of your own destiny financially, and also to, you know, participate in running a business and uh, you know, and that can lead on to other things like Chris was talking about the food carts. You might start out one place and end up in, you know, in a whole different area and you might expand upon things, uh, end up being able to save up enough, enough money to buy a rental property and do what you want with it. And, you know, the city, you know, uh, should not be stepping in on, uh, especially with, you know, people having other motives as well, you know, a competitive uh, rental market and so forth, yeah. to be able to, to influence the city 
to advantage themselves by yeah. by knocking another concept out of the way. And, yeah. you know, and that's where I get into this, you know, the equality across the board of people to be able to go and have their have their property rights and their ability and also take on the risk and the expense of setting these places up. It's not like you're just ready to go. There's investments in, in linens and towels and all this stuff and, and all these short term rentals. And, you know, I remember years ago, even 15 years ago, renting cottages on Lake Champlain, you know, and, you know, how, and, and that was fine. And that was a huge business and still is for people who own these seasonal cottages and they rent them out by the week or the month to people coming up to want to have the Vermont experience, uh, you know, whatever that may mean to them. You know, really made a good case here earlier, just a few seconds ago, about the, you know, the case for why uh, individual tenants should be able to participate in the uh, short term rental market. And I think that, you know, um, it's a question of equality of opportunity. It should not be subject to just the people who actually own the property, but uh, you know, the folks that live there should be able to to rent out um, if they have uh, the appropriate um, agreements in place. And take, for example, as David said, you know, you have someone who maybe is a college student. They, you know, are studying abroad for six months. Um, they have a nice place. They've secured a long term affordable lease. Uh, they, and they'd like to keep it when they come back or maybe they just don't want to be hassled with having to try to find a new place. Or maybe it's like one of my neighbors who works in the nonprofit sector and spends six months out of the year down in Africa or in uh central america doing doing work so um certainly you know this should be open to anyone who would like to get involved uh in the market now i'm gonna bring us I back think that's well said, yeah. it is it is very well said and i'm gonna come back to this other conversation that that got skipped right over <laughs> why do people believe that they have a right to other people's property now, Chris, you and I have talked about this a lot, and you know that I'm a very um, charitable person. My husband and I donate a ton of money and time. Uh, we also rent out our apartments and our rooms for less than what the market rate is because we think that it's highway robbery. Um, and we wanna make sure that we have good people. That's why we've had long-term renters. Um, we would rather they stay, but you know, when we're talking about college kids or people who don't care about the place and then they trash it uh, because that happens. I mean, we've had to evict people. We've had our property trashed by people who don't care. And this idea that the city has the right to force me to rent to people when it's when I work for it, I pay the mortgage, I take all the risk. I'm responsible for everything. This idea that I should be forced to rent to people that maybe I don't want to. I, I, we, I, that is the thing that I just cannot get over. And, and I, and don't say, well, there, you know, people, you know, don't make enough money because that is a whole other conversation that can be had. Why is it? that people believe they are owed anything by anyone else. Why do people believe they have the right to live in Burlington? As an example, like maybe if you don't make enough money, you just can't live in Burlington. And that's an ugly thing to say, but it's these questions that nobody but seems to ask. I mean, that, you know, my wife yeah. uh, shares a similar perspective and we would love to stay in Burlington, but we've had a very difficult time finding, you know, a reasonable, affordable home that's in relatively good condition that we can yeah. actually afford. Um, yeah. As for your question, I'm not sure that people think that they have a, a right to, you know, individual private property, but I do believe that there is a basic human right to be able to put a roof over your head and food on the show, um, on the table. Um, and, and I can't really, you know, it's why, you know, um, but why does that have to be in my house? Why, why does it have to be in my <laughs> house? And, and if I don't but, do it, I, know, I'm punished for it. You should be able to rent it out, not rent it out. You should be able to determine whether it should be long term or short term. Um, you know, that's I, that's the perspective that I have. And I think, you know, if you look at the issue of affordability, I mean, obviously we have some big factors weighing in on it, you know, that the, the big elephant in the room that you've alluded to. But again, I think, you know, there's some basic supply and demand going on here. And, you know, I know that there's, you know, some properties here, the large parcels that are uh, being used for 
I should say recreational purposes right now. They're up in the, the hill section. Uh, that, you know, might be a great place mm -hmm. to maybe look at building some housing, but. Yeah, yeah. No, um, David, did you want to say something? Well, um, I believe that, you know, uh, Burlington needs a wake up call to restore kind of like what Chris said, you know, go back to basics a bit here. Um, and certainly they should not in any way, shape or form be telling people what they can and cannot do with their property. I mean, if you want to go, you know, for example, you know, like New York City, um, if you want to live on Park Avenue, you have to pay the price to live on Park Avenue. The city doesn't say, well, you have to have affordable housing, you know, uh, in, in these buildings in Park Avenue, you know, and uh, what it, which is a, you know, a considerably liberal city. I think we can all agree, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You know, uh, even there, they understand that, you know, if you want to live in a really nice neighborhood in a downtown dynamic area with bars and restaurants around you, you're going to pay a premium for that. And, you know, and if you are looking for housing, uh, certainly everybody has a right to a, a right to a roof over their head. But, you know, it also isn't a gift. You know, uh, the, the American spirit is that you go out and work hard. And everybody works hard and, you know, you find a way and you make your way through life. You don't just, you know, uh, you know, it's not a handout. Um, yeah, and and the city already has things in place like the Vermont Housing Authority and so forth, where people can go and find affordable housing, not just within Burlington, but maybe the Monuski or South Burlington and so forth. And as you stretch out in Colchester, you know, there are other areas. Um, the downtown jewel of Church Street, which as Chris well put quite well, which is in uh, serious uh, disrepair. Um, and as a person that has trouble with his legs, I can tell you I've stumbled many a times out of there with, you know, uh, with bricks missing, um, you know, right in the middle of Church Street, you know, plates that have slipped, manhole covers that are loose, you know, and, uh, you know, I've seen a dramatic change in the appearance of, of, of the downtown area um, in the last 20 years. Dramatic change. Particularly and uh, not for the good. What's Chris, that? what was that? Yeah. I said, I think particularly under the current administration where the focus has been on new construction and maybe not as much focus on, on maintaining what we have. But to circle back to your previous question and to kind of build upon some of the things David said, I'm also thinking that there may be a little bit of a disconnect between the housing needs and the type of housing that's available. And as I understand mm. it, single room occupancy is, a, is, a, is an issue. But again, that comes back to zoning, that comes back to regulation. One of the biggest yeah. impediments I found to resolving this, or as I understand it, uh, has been the parking requirement. And, um, you know, I want to shout out to the city and give them credit. They've taken steps to uh, address that so as to make it easier to build. And I think that, you know, obviously we have a limited capacity of vacant land in the city, hence the need to, you know, maybe look at infill or other types of density. But I think building up may certainly be uh, one option, but then you're going to run into the argument of, you know, well, that's going to, you know, alter the, the character of the city and the skyline. So it's, again, it's, there's multiple different points of view and trying to, you know, bring everyone together to come to a solution yeah. can sometimes be uh, quite akin to like herding cats, but um, <laughs> at the end of the day, if, if mm -hmm. uh, we've got to find ways to make it easier for the people to build the kind of housing that is needed and that is ultimately um, affordable. Yeah, and that's what I would like to see people sit down and have real substantive conversations about what actually can be done, meaningful things that can be done, ways that the private sector and private people can help those in need and to make up for some of these issues. Because, um, you know, I've been, I've been pretty much homeless before. I've been on Section 8 housing before. You know, a lot of times people think that when I when I talk about this stuff, that it's coming from a place of, oh, of privilege, you know, oh, you're just a landlord white lady. And so you don't know anything. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. I've also been, you know, I'm in recovery. I'll celebrate 12 years sober this year. Um, you know, that was not a good time in my life. I got the assistance that I needed to get on my feet and I don't begrudge anyone that, but I also lived with my family 
I busted my behind. I got myself sober. Um, you know, I made sure to, uh, you know, I was able to kind of put the pieces back together and get off of the assistance because I didn't want to be on it. You know, I felt like mm -hmm. for me personally, it was like, it, it made me feel, um, you know, I didn't want to be dependent on the government. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. Now I do have, um, that is not to say that everyone has the same opportunities. That is not to say that everyone has the same skills or the same abilities because they don't. That's why I believe it's my responsibility as a person to open my home up and offer rents that are reasonable. Um, it's when the government is trying to tell me that I have to do it and then they want to punish me for it if I don't. That's where I have a real problem. Yeah, I have to say that I agree with that 100%. And, uh, uh, you know, I think Burlington seeing that there's an issue and people knowing, okay, it's really hard to find a good apartment in Burlington. Let's face yeah. it. Okay. I know I looked for one. Uh, it took me two months of searching to find a decent apartment in, in the Burlington area. And I actually moved into South Burlington first and then an opportunity became available in the downtown. And, uh, you know, so I grabbed that up when I had the opportunity and, you know, um, <sighs> you cannot regulate Burlington out of a housing problem. You can't regulate <laughs> yourself out of it, okay? Especially when there is a massive amount of regulation that inhibits, as uh, we discussed earlier, inhibits the ability for, say, um, a developer to go in and put up a unit somewhere, you know, where they, you know, whether it be 50 apartments or 100 apartments or whatever. And, you know, they should be lifting all of the regulations and restrictions that they put in place. Certainly, we have to be cognizant of the environment and the impact on the area and all those things. But it doesn't take, you know, it shouldn't take $100,000 of investment before you, before you, uh, you know, break ground uh, to deal with the city uh, yeah. because it's this, it's this uh, level of uh, regulation and red tape that, you know, people say, well, I'm going to go build somewhere else. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's how that's how Burlington has gotten themselves in this problem in the first place. Yeah. And, you know, certainly the university has a responsibility, you know, if they are going to admit more and more and more students like they have been doing in a trend over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. they keep increasing the, the faculty, you know, the uh, the student body. Uh, you know, each year there's more and more and more. And uh, although they have made some investments and put up some properties that are, uh, you know, um, recently like the one down on uh, St. Paul Street and so forth, uh, they've done some, but there's really a lot more work to be done there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and really the city needs to get out of the way and let let uh, entrepreneurial people go out and help solve these problems because government rarely solves any of our problems. <laughs> um, they create a lot of problems for us. So, um, you know, by crushing the entrepreneurial spirit of people that are doing Airbnb, you know, um, and, and the perception perhaps that lingers out there uh, among people that somehow people that do Airbnb are these wealthy folks that, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of property and they're just like, you know, screw the little guy. Um, we're going to, you know, just, you know, rent to our select people who come here as tourists and we're not going to be part of the community. And that is mm -hmm. you know, so far from the truth. You know, yep. and many, many people who do uh, engage in the Airbnb business, like when I was doing it, um, I was doing it in, in, in uh, to help supplement my income so I could stay in my apartment. Yep. You know, uh, it was, Which you know, um, we had alternative, uh, alternative places to stay. Sometimes we'd stay in other uh, people that we knew, Airbnb units that were vacant in that particular time. And we would do that for each other and help each other out, a community of people. And we're mm -hmm. just business business 
entrepreneurs making our way through and figuring it out. Um, yep. and, and, you know, it, there's, it, it's Hold not on. an easy business to be in. It's a, it, there's a lot that of work. That is true. Okay. That is and, true, Chris. And, uh, so hold on, guys. We're we're talking over each other a yeah. little bit here, Chris. Why don't you? Uh, we're we're getting towards the end here. Um, why don't you get the last word? I would just say, you know, it would be curious to get some more data on this, not just on the economic impact of short-term rentals, but it would also be curious to know the amount of uh, housing that has become de facto student housing off campus in the areas of Buell, Bradley Street, mm -hmm. South Union Green, Loomis, uh, Isham Street, uh, in you know, figure that out. And I would also be curious to know what number of units uh, have been set aside through the various nonprofit programs to uh, designated as, as affordable as well. That is an ec excellent, excellent point. And let's not forget every time they convert anything to UVM, that becomes nonprofit. Uh, non, well, that, that's uh, the point. And they don't pay taxes and they pay a pilot agreement, you know, payments in lieu of taxes. And you know, yeah. I'm not when, how long of an agreement's in place or when it's up for renewal, but certainly. Uh, oh, it's the, the mayor, the mayor just uh, was negotiating with them, I think a year or two ago, and they only pay a couple hundred thousand dollars a year at UVM on uh, over a billion dollars worth of assets.